Lord, I shall give these laws unto thy people. Hear me. Oh, hear me. All pay heed. The Lord, the Lord Jehovah, has given unto you these 15. Oi. Ten. Ten commandments. God has set before you this day his laws of life. Called my wife this week because I was working on this sermon. It was Wednesday. And I wanted to, to come up with something, some example, some illustration of something uh, that I do more than I think I do, right? And you see the problem on trying to figure this out on your own, right? And I, it's hard to figure out something you do more than you think you do, right? A little bit of a blind spot. So I called my wife and I was like, hey, honey, what's something that I do more than I think I do? And I'm hoping that she's going to say something like, you tell us you love us way more than you think you do. Or you're very much more attentive than you think you are. You're on your cell phone more than you think you are. Like, right, I didn't miss a beat. There wasn't like a let me think about it. It was like, you're on your phone a lot, which was really convicting. Because I'm pretty sure I've said from up here and from in the sanctuary, you don't need to be on your phone as much. Get off your phone, get off your phone, get off your phone. And I'm apparently guilty. So she was like, no, I can come up with something different. And I was like, no, no, it's fine. This actually works really well. I'll, I'll fall on my sword. You do things more than you think you do, and you might be living a lie because of it. I kind of felt like a hypocrite. I was like, man, I've, I've sat up here, I've told people not to do something, I've really tried to work on looking at it less, but apparently like, I'm not doing as good of a job as I'd like. I feel like I was living a lie. There are things we do more than we think we do. We live in a place, a world of sort of self-deception, I guess, in that way. So we're continuing on, obviously, in our study of the Ten Commandments, and today we're going to be talking about two. We're covering two today, lying and stealing. Uh, lying and stealing are what we're talking about today. And when I first looked at this, I thought most people are probably going to think they're more honest than they think they are, and they don't steal at all. And so part of our task this morning is going to be to discover how it is that we're actually not as honest as we think, and that we probably steal in ways we're unaware of, right? So what I want us to do is I want us to talk about that. We're going to have to establish that and then move forward and learn how do we leave behind that life and move into a life of generosity and honesty because that's the difference, right? That's the opposite. Being generous and honest is the opposite of stealing and lying. So we're going to start uh, in Leviticus 19. The reason why we're in Leviticus and not in Exodus 20 is because uh, Exodus 20, those, those two commands are, are pretty short. Uh, and so we want, to, we want to start there. Uh, but it's, the commands are as they read, right? You shall not steal. You shall not, not bear false witness against your neighbor. And so I want us to look at lying and stealing, honesty and generosity, and then what grace has to do with it. So we lie and steal more than we think we do. We lie and steal more than we think we do. Pretty much every ancient Near Eastern culture had laws against lying and stealing. And, and our Israelites are no different. Look at verse 11 of Leviticus 19. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. So stealing is the act of taking property from another person without permission and doing so in secret. Okay, that's stealing. And ancient Near Eastern cultures had a pretty robust understanding of what stealing was. They uh, legislated against larceny, against misappropriation, against embezzlement. They were, they were well aware of these sort of what we would consider now sophisticated forms of theft. They had legislation against it, but they had other issues to deal with. Uh, back in those days, you had roving brand, bands of robbers or brigands that would waylay travelers on the road. And so there's records of kings going out and doing battles against basically gangs. Uh, they would ride into towns, they would raid a town that was undefended and take everything from them and leave. Okay, and most of the time in, in these cultures and ancient Near East, you would, you would have, uh, the punishment would not be something like death. Uh, sometimes it was, but usually it was a fine of some kind. Now in our, uh, for the Israelites, for the Ten Commandments, uh, 
they never punish theft by death unless there was an assault involved. So never by death. Lying, on the other hand, is the act of being deliberately untruthful for personal gain or to damage the reputation of another person. And lying was taking, taken very seriously in these cultures. Do you know why that might be? Especially lying in court. The reason why it was taken so seriously is because they didn't have like a crime lab they could go take their evidence to. It's not like, well, we're going to go see what forensics has. We're going to go see, you know, Jacob in the forensic lab. No, there's, there's none of that. You pretty much, if there was a crime being committed, you had a witness, maybe two or three witnesses, and that might be all you had to go on. And if one of those guys is lying or a couple of those guys are lying, guess what? You've got a real problem. And so lying in some of these cultures was punished by whatever it was the, the sentence was going to be for that person that you were lying against. That's now your sentence. So that's how they handled that sometimes. And what these two commands are really dealing with, what the deeper heart issue is, is selfishness. These cultures, these commandments are dealing with selfishness. We're trying to legislate selfishness because it's kind of a natural thing uh, to lie when your back's against a wall. It's a natural thing if nobody's watching over you or there's no consequences uh, to take something that doesn't belong to you. It's a very tempting thing, and they understood that. They recognized it. But stealing and lying are all about saying that what is good for you, what you want, isn't actually what's best. What, my, what I want, my needs are way more important than your rights or your needs. Even in lying, you might say, well, I'm just trying to protect this person. I'm telling these lies so that they feel better about themselves. Look, lying is all about protecting the liar. Lying is all about the convenience of the liar. It's the easy road. It's always the easy road, even with little white lies. But we lie in ways that we don't realize. We steal in ways that we don't realize. And, I, and, and the, what I like about this passage in Leviticus is it gives us some illustrations while still being scripture of ways that we lie that we may not think. So let's look at some of these. We take advantage of other people. Look at verse 13. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. So when we live a life that's kind of driven by our needs and our desires, when we're selfish, we start viewing other people as a means to an end, a way to get the things that I want. And if they have something that I want, they need to be moved out of the way or their stuff needs to be pulled from them. So in the, uh, in what God is legislating against here is uh, somebody who's owning a property that has workers, sending his workers home and being like, I'll pay you tomorrow, and then I'll pay you tomorrow, and then I'll pay you tomorrow. Those workers are counting on that money to buy food for their family that day. We steal in ways we might not think about. We take advantage of people and take advantage of systems in ways that we don't think about and steal. One of these is time. We steal time. We go to work. We show up five, ten minutes late. It's not that big of a deal. There's a long line at Starbucks, right? So I roll in, and I'm like, oh, man, my coffee's empty. I'm going to refill it, so I'm going to walk over to the bake room, take my time. Oh, there's Steve. Steve's my buddy. What up, Steve? Talk to Steve for a while. Come back. Got my coffee. Sit down. Sit down. Oh, got a text. Let me check my text. This is really important. My wife wants to know what we're having for dinner tonight. It's mine I have to cook, and I don't know what it is. So send it back. Then I finally start working, maybe. Then, guess what? It's the magical lunchtime. Time to go to lunch. I only get an hour for lunch, but an hour and a half, that's okay. I'll come back. And then, oh, there's Steve again. What up, Steve? High five, Steve. Talk to Steve for a while. Steve's a great guy. <laughs> and then I finally sit down at my desk and do some more work. Oh, I'm tired. It's that 2.30 thing again. Five-hour energy drinks always tell me about. So I'm going to go and get some more coffee, come back. By the time you actually sit down and get any work done, you've probably worked about an hour and a half, and you're stealing from your company. You're stealing time. They're paying you to produce over a certain portion of the day, and you're not doing that. You're stealing. We steal from our spouses. We go home. Spouse wants to talk to us, tell us about her day or his day, and we're thinking about something else completely different. Uh-huh, yep. Uh-huh. Yeah, oh yeah, totally, honey. I totally get that. Uh-huh. Yep. Stealing time. You're stealing time from them, time that you could be devoted to them. Or you're on your phone, like I am, apparently. So there's that. We steal from our families. 
Again, we steal time from them. We choose other things that they could be doing. We steal time from the church. Uh Uh-oh. Look, I'm going to say this, and, and I hope you understand. We do a lot of things here at Park City's Baptist Church. There's a lot of things going on. I'm going to give you permission. There's no expectation that you're here for everything. Not everything was intended for your section of our congregation. However, Sunday mornings are for you. And I think if you're not here on Sunday mornings with regularity, with frequency, you're stealing from each other. Because church is better, not the more people that are here, but the more people that are here more regularly. Because we can build relationships with one another, we can spend time together, we can talk to one another, I can get to know you. It's really hard to get to know somebody that rolls in one Sunday a month. If you don't feel connected to Park Cities, could be some things we're doing we could do better. I'd love to hear some of those, honestly. But it also could be, maybe you could be here more, and that would help. So let's be careful about how we're stealing time from each other. We also like to lie to ourselves. Verse 14. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. Verse 14. This is an interesting command because in our day and age, the idea of doing cruelties to the disabled is pretty horrifying to us, right? This is an interesting command. But when we look at somebody and we think that in any way, shape, or form we're better than them, we have a tendency to ridicule. Maybe in our own heart, our own mind, because their failure makes our success look better. Their misfortune makes our fortune so much greater. And rather than offering praise to God, we criticize, we put them down so that our stuff looks even better than theirs. This gives us an inflated sense of our own importance, our own value, And when you're not finding your value and your worth in Jesus Christ, do you know where you find it? In lies. You start telling yourself lies. Because Jesus is the only thing, only person that you don't have to inflate, you don't have to make sound better in order for him to be better. We like to bend the rules in our favor. Favor, Look at verse 15. Verse 15. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. The court was a place in ancient Israel where people went to get justice. And ideally, it didn't matter if you were poor, if you were rich, you would be treated the same way. Because it's just as much a sin to treat somebody who is rich with bias as it is to treat somebody who's poor. We're supposed to treat everyone equally, especially in court. Especially in court. Now, we live in a society that's ruled by law. That's what's so great about the United States. We have many people that that are coming to our country that want to live in our country, not just because there's jobs and economic opportunity. That's not the only reason. It's because we're a country ruled by law. Look, we had an election about a year and a half ago where about half our country was very, very, very upset with the outcome. And what happened? Did we have a civil war? Did things just like break down? No. And you have a, a half the country that's really upset. Because we're a country ruled by law, we admit, we all agree together that there's a law in place and it protects us, it protects our rights. That's one of the things that makes our country so great and worth living in. Now, with that being said, we also like to use the law to benefit ourselves. We sometimes abuse the law. Let me offer this as an example. Some of us have uh, careers or work where we employ people whose Uh, immigration status is in question. And what we do in those situations sometimes is we pay them less than what their work deserves because we know that they can't go and complain to anybody because they might be here illegally. That's stealing. And that's stealing from them. And we need to be aware of the way we're using the law to benefit ourselves. We vote for legislation that benefits only ourselves and not anybody else, our section of the population. We take cash payments at work for things so we don't have to pay it reported on our taxes. That's stealing. Stealing from our government. Now, whether or not income tax should be a thing or not, that's up to you. Let you deal with that. Thanks, Woodrow Wilson, by the way. We look for loopholes. We look for technicalities, anything we can to convince ourselves that we're living a perfectly squeaky clean life. 
and maybe we're spending a lot of time stealing. We also talk a lot about people behind their backs. Look at verse 16. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. There are a few things more valuable than a reputation, a good reputation, right? You work really hard to build a good reputation. But there's something that we like to do, and we don't talk about it very much anymore. We used to. We used to, Baptists, we love to talk about this. We don't talk about it much anymore. It's called gossip. We love to gossip. And, and I think it starts out pretty innocently, right? Like, hey, did you hear about what happened with so-and-so? And what happens in that conversation is you have a little bit of truth. You have kind of the story about how things kind of went. And then that person you're telling the story to is going to ask you a question like, well, why did they do that? And you don't really know because either you don't remember or you weren't told that. But because you don't think it's all that important, you fill in the blank. Well, what I think is, or what I guess happened, or what I'm assuming happened, and when that story gets told over and over and over again, the guess and the assumption gets dropped out. And that becomes gospel. And that's a lie. That's a lie. And Alfred Lord Tennyson says, a lie which is a half-truth is ever the blackest of lies. Is ever the blackest of lies. And it is. Because it's got this little kernel of truth in it. And that's how gossip can be damaging to other people. So the question is, do I have to live like this? Do I have to live with dishonesty? Do I have to be dishonest? No, I don't think we do. In fact, I think there's another way forward, but I don't think we take it because we don't see the value in it. So let's look. We can gain more from honesty and generosity than we think. We can gain more from honesty and generosity than we think. Turn over to Ephesians 4. Turn over to Ephesians 4 with me, and while you're turning there, I think these are the opposite of stealing and lying, honesty and generosity. Because as Christians, we should probably be known for these things, right? Generosity, think about it. As Christians, we should be the most giving of people, the most generous, not just giving to charitable organizations, to the church, things like that, although we should. We should also be generous with our tips, generous with uh, our wages, generous with, with our gifts to people. We should be generous. We should also be honest. We worship a man who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We should be pretty closely connected to honesty and wanting to be honest. But I think we choose deception and we choose theft because it's easier and because we don't see the advantage, the value in choosing. We don't see what we can get out of being honest and generous. And so Paul's writing to the Ephesians, and I think he gives us some things we can, we can try. One, we can gain real friends by being honest and generous. Look at verse 25. Therefore, of chapter 4, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We are members of one another. Paul's talking about the fact that this church is an interconnected body. So being in a church, being a part of a church, is unlike any group or organization or people that you've ever been a part of. Because it's not like a club or an association. It's a living organism. It's the body of Christ. And because it's the body of Christ, there are certain things that should be foundational to it. And truth, honesty is one of them. But because we live in a culture where putting up a front is kind of the way you live your life, we have a hard time being real and authentic with people. We put up a face. We act like everything's okay. We don't tell people what's going on. We don't let people into our struggles. We don't let people into our failings. Heavens, no. It's never our fault. We never, ever do those things. Look, just because this church is a pretty building doesn't need to be full of perfect, pretty people. You can be real. You can share with people what's really going on in your life. Now, you don't have to wear a t-shirt with what's going on. That's one thing. But you can open up to some people. Get in a connect group and open up to some people. Share with them what's going on. Stop lying that everything's okay, because we all know it's not. Not everything is fine. We can also have conflicts that end. Look at verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let me see if this sounds familiar. You go home. You sit down on the couch. Wife, husband. I'm going to say wife in this illustration because this is my experience from my angle. Wife sits down next to you, and you can just tell, like, she's not sitting close to you. She's like, over there. You're like, okay. Is, every, is everything okay? You know, float that out there, little test. And then you hear these words. 
the words of death. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> Y'all, she ain't fine. <laughs> she ain't fine at all. It's not a sin to be angry, <clears throat> but as Christians, we cannot be characterized by anger. Don't be an angry person, right? And one of the chief ways that we can be honest with one another is to be honest about the fact that we're angry with each other. You can actually have conflicts that come to an end. Some of us love the running war. We want the longest possible drawn-out conflict, and I don't know why. When you could just address it really quickly and solve the problem, shut it down. We, don't, we ignore things. We stuff things. We don't say what's really bothering us. We say, I'm fine. We let, we let things go when really we don't. Or, this is the good one, passive-aggressive. Some of you, that's like your art medium, like passive-aggressiveness. Passive like, that's what you paint in. You're a master at passive-aggressiveness. We, we leave notes, right? And you leave off the, the love at the end so that they know, oh, something's up, but I don't know what it is. Or the, uh, the Facebook post to the world, right? Or to the, the tweet that's like, I'm not mentioning any names, but da-da-da-da-da-da-da. <laughs> Becky, you know who you are, <laughs> right? You know what you did to me. If you're going to live a life of honesty, you actually have to have conflicts that end. You've actually got to shut things down because it gives people chance to apologize and strengthen your relationship, one. Two, Clearly, there's something going on that's greater. Look back at verse 27, and give no opportunity for the devil. We have an enemy. He's not some mythical creature. He actually wants to do you harm. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to break up your relationships, break up your marriages. And one of the best ways that he does that is by being like, just make them play the guessing game. It's fine. Tell him you're fine. Don't do that. Don't give him an opportunity. Don't do an, uh, you can say, hey, I don't really want to talk about it right now, but yeah, no, I'm not okay. That's fine. That's okay. Or, hey, can we talk about it later? That's okay. But I'm fine and pretending like everything's okay when it clearly is not. It's not okay. It's not fair. And guys do that too. I was just, we, we are also passive aggressive. We are not perfect. We can give gifts. Look at verse 28. We have gifts to give. 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. One of the best movies uh, that, that I've enjoyed in, in a while uh, is uh, Ocean's Eleven. Right? It's kind of old, I guess, but I, I've enjoyed it. And they have a whole series. They've now got Ocean's Eight, where there's kind of his sister, I think, is the, the mastermind. But the movies are all about this, like, disparate team of thieves trying to put together this elaborate heist to steal something from somebody that, by the end, you're kind of like, oh, he deserved to get that stolen from him. You know, like, it's never like, they're not like St. Mary's Widows of the Poor. You know, it's not like that is who they're doing this big heist from. It's like a casino or something like that. You're like, yeah, they deserve that. I think it's interesting that... I wonder what a movie would be like if it was like the same group of people trying to figure out how to be as generous as they possibly could be. Like, what would that even look like? Like, what's... You get a lot of messages every day. One of the primary ones you get is that you need to consume, you need to buy, you need to purchase, you need to gain, you need to take, you need to grab. That's called capitalism. And you get it all the time. It's the sea you swim in. And so because you swim in that sea, guess what? It's, you can't just like stop hearing it. You have to replace it with another me message. So the energy and effort you put into gaining all the things that you gain, and, and we do spend a lot of time doing that, we need to take some of that energy and creativity and put it towards being generous. You're not going to trip, fall, and money's going to spill out into the offering plate. Okay? You have to actually be intentional about it. You've got a budget for it. You've got a plan for it. It's not going to happen by accident because... We like to hold on to our stuff. You've got to use some creativity in being generous with your resources, with your time, with your energy, and with your talents. I think we have a lot of brilliant people in this room, and I think if we leveraged it for generosity, we legitimately could change things in our city and in our world. We could also use our mouths for what they were meant to be used for. Look at verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of our mouths, but only such as what's good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God 
by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Your mouth is meant for two things. Oh, three, if you count eating, which you should always count eating. Two, when it comes to speaking, giving glory to God and giving praise to other people. Giving glory to God and giving encouragement to other people. Your mouth is meant to constantly be speaking praise. I know we like, some of us are, are quiet, and that's great. But when your mouth opens, let it be glorifying to God. And that doesn't always mean that you're, you know, lifting hands and singing a worship song. It can mean that just by whatever it is that you're speaking about. Maybe you're speaking for justice or doing good work or whatever it is. Speaking, giving glory to God. The second thing it needs to be about is building up others. Often, in the other hand, we use it to tear other people down. We call it a joke. And it's supposed to be funny, and it's not. We rip each other down with our words. God created by speaking. When we speak, our words have an effect because we are image bearers of God. We are made in His image. So when you open your mouth, consider what it's going to do to the person or people around you. Is it going to make them more like Christ, less like Christ? Is it going to give glory to God, or is it going to detract from God's glory? If it does, don't say it. Don't say it. So, how in the world do I start even remotely pursuing a life of honesty and generosity? Because pretty much your heart is going to lead you toward dishonesty and stealing as much as it can. So what can you do? Well, we need grace more than we think. We need grace more than we think. We're never going to be 100% honest, 100% generous. And as much as you might like to be, and as much as it's something to work towards, there are going to be times where you get caught flat-footed or you're surprised by the depth of your own depravity. Again, we all have blind spots. We have things that we don't see that we're doing. And so we need something there. And that is what grace is for. It's why we need Jesus Christ. It's why we need a relationship with him if we're ever going to stand a chance of walking in the manner in which we were created. Because apart from Christ, we will constantly deceive ourselves, other people, for our benefit and their detriment. So if we back up a couple verses, we'll see what we need grace for. Look at verse 20. Verse 20. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. So there we see the first reason why we need grace. Because we need grace to know what truth actually is. If you don't have a central standard of what grace is, if you don't have an anchor of, of, sorry, of what truth is, you'll find different things that you'll consider to be true. You'll kind of put this hodgepodge, this perspective, this point of view, it's true for me life together, rather than having something that it's anchored to in a standard. And so you'll consider deceit to be honest because you don't really have a central truth. That's why we need grace. We need God to reveal to us what is true and what is true about Christ. We need to be able to apply that to our lives. We also need grace to root out the deceit and the selfishness that we have in our lives. Verse 22. Verse 22. To put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt. And what's it corrupt through? Deceitful desires. Lying, stealing. We need grace to root out the deceitfulness in our own hearts. When I was preparing this, I couldn't really figure out anything that I did more than I thought I did. Why? Because it was a blind spot. You have deceitful desires, things that aren't just lying to other people, but are lying to you. You don't know that it's a, it's a wrong desire. You just think it's, it's normal and natural. So we have to spend time in the Word, spend time in prayer, because we need grace more than we think we do. So we've got to turn to the Lord and be like, Lord, I don't even understand why and what it is that I do, but I do things that are dishonest, and I do things that are taking from other people, and I don't realize it. Show me where it is that I'm deceitful. Show me where it is that I'm stealing, and help me fix it. Because you're not ever going to root those things out on your own. It's like thinking that you're going to fix uh, uh, an illness a bacteria on your own, an infection. An infection has to be fixed by antibodies. It doesn't just go away, right? I'm not a doctor, but I believe that's the right thing. Would a doctor please nod their head? I'm just kidding. I'm fine. You need God to come in to your life and fix it and address it. You'll never have the honest and generous life that you could have if you hide things from people. 
if you continue to be deceitful. Look, some of you are sitting on big secrets. Some of you got one that you're sitting on and it's a big deal and it could be a game changer for your family, for you, for your job. One day that's going to come to light. And my question is, do you want somebody to find out about it? Or do you just want to come clean? And I'm going to be honest, if you, need, if, you, if you want to come clean, you're going to need grace for that. You need grace for that. But be courageous and know that God is with you as you share that with the person you need to share that with. Let us not have secrets. Lastly, we need grace, grace to be transformed. Look at verse 23. Verse 23. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in the true righteousness and holiness. Since you have such a deceitful heart, practicing honesty and generosity, and my heart's deceitful too. It lies to me all the time. Practicing honesty and generosity aren't always going to fix the fact that at the core, we're selfish and dishonest. You need a new heart. You need a new self. You need a new you. You 2.0. New person. The only place you get that is from Jesus Christ. Jesus died so that you might be renewed. Jesus went to the cross so that you could have that new self because human beings weren't made to be deceitful. I know everybody lies is kind of like a, 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 a slogan we have, but it's not actually the way we were intended to be. We were intended to be very honest and to be giving in a relationship with God because we're supposed to be the image. We're supposed to bear the image. And so within the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all love each other and all giving and they never lie to each other. And as people, we're supposed to mi mirror that to others. We're supposed to show other people what real, honest, generous relationships are supposed to look like. But we have a hard time with that because we're so self-interested. And Jesus Christ goes to the cross. He dies because we can't keep lying and stealing straight. We can't keep those commandments. And he can. He goes to the cross. He dies and raises again on the third day so that you can have a new self. So that you can reap the rewards and the benefits and the advantages of living this honest and generous life. All you have to do is believe. Don't lie to yourself and think, oh, I can earn it. I can get it from God on my own. I can be a good person. You know what you're doing? You're lying to God and telling him that he's wrong, which he's not. And two, you're robbing him of his glory. Because he died so that you might live, so that he might receive all of the glory. It's why we don't have any works to do in it. And if you're not, a, if you are a believer today, you know you don't have it all figured out. You know you need grace. But every once in a while, we let that lie creep back in. Like, oh, I can do it, God. I got it from here. Thanks. You can take the training wheels off now, Jesus. I got this. And then like, right into the bushes. And Jesus Christ graciously picks us up. He scoops us up. And he puts us back on the bike. And he puts grace back on the wheels. Look, you do a lot of things you don't realize you do. We're blind to a lot of the things that we do. Hopefully we've uncovered some of them today. We don't have time to do them all. But more than anything, you need to stop believing the lie that you can figure it out on your own. You need others, and you need the grace of God. You need Jesus Christ, and you need him today. You can meet him today, right now. You can go through those doors, and you can start a relationship with him, and it'll be the most honest and generous relationship you've ever had. Because yeah, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but he, only, he never takes away out of his own selfishness. God is never selfish, or rather I should say, God is the only creature who can, God is the only being who can be selfish and it work out for everybody else, right? Because even in his self-centeredness, because the world is created around him, he is giving and he is kind and he is generous and he is loving and he has good gifts to give to his people, his children. So let's pray together and think about accepting those gifts today. Father God, thank you so much for the gift of Jesus Christ that we are no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer slaves to dishonesty and to stealing and to selfishness, but we can set that free. We can let, be let go from it by trusting and believing in you. And so God, I pray for anybody in this room that hasn't done that, I pray that they would today. That they turn off the lies of the world, the lies that they tell themselves, and for one shining moment, your truth and your honesty would come through 
and they would recognize themselves for what they are, which is a person in need, in need of a Savior. God, I pray that they would meet you today. For the rest of us, Lord, I pray that you would show us the parts of our lives where we're being dishonest with others. For those that are going to have hard conversations maybe this afternoon or this week because they've been hiding something, I pray for grace. I pray for restored relationships. I pray for forgiveness and healing, no matter how long that road may go. So, Lord God, we love you and we praise you. We ask all this in your son's name.